Welcome to The Upshot. Yes, that's right. It's another Upshot in the same week. Can you believe it? It's happening. I'm Charlie Eisenhood, the publisher. Joining me, Josh Mansfield. And we are now into our two times a week format. We will definitely love to get your feedback uh, as we kind of venture into this. Don't forget, we've got Worlds coming up around the corner. We'll be doing shows all week, daily shows uh, after every round to keep you up to date with what, everything that's going on in Utah for Worlds. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, today, we're going to focus on the upcoming Disc Golf Pro Tour event, the Portland Open. It starts on Friday, and uh, we've got a lot to, to get to today. We're going to be talking with Dustin Keegan, who designed the course uh, in just a little bit here on The Upshot. And uh, first and foremost, let's just get some some brass tacks out of the way. Uh, this event, Portland Open, has been on the Pro Tour for a few years now, and it was it, it's been at the Blue Lake Park course. Uh, for the inaugural event in 2019, and uh, and then it was canceled last year because of COVID, and then they had to move the course from Blue Lake to a brand new course, Glendevere, uh, that was designed by Dustin Keegan for this year because again COVID. Uh, Oregon specifically has been very very slow to sort of allow events to happen, um, particularly on you know state park land. Uh, or or otherwise, you know, sort of run by city or uh, state government. So the Pro Tour didn't feel like they were confident that they were going to be able to use their course reservation at Blue Lake. And so it will be at a brand new course that we've all not seen before. It is on a ball golf course. So it's got some real uh, OTB vibes, Josh. Yeah, it it really does. Uh, looking at the caddy book, um, when you compare, I mean, OTB, we talked about the difficulty and the length of the course. Uh, you pull up Portland Open and you come in at a whopping 12,700 feet, which comes out to almost 1,100 feet more than OTB Open was. So uh, I don't know if we're going to see Roller Olympics again. I don't know if it's going to be lots of low ceilings. Um I'm excited to talk to Dustin Keegan because I think that skeptical is the uh, the best way I could I could put my uh, attitude right now of the change in venues, and I understand the necessity of it. But coming off De La Viega, um, it feels like I'm coming back down to earth to go back to a ball golf course. <laughs> it, it's certainly going to be a uh, jarring shift. I mean, looking at the caddy book, and again, you know, we'll we'll discuss this more a little later in the show. Lots of um, use of the trees on these on this golf course, and lots of use of hazards. So there's lots of greens with multiple sand traps in the area that play as hazards. Uh, the greens, of course, are OB. Um, so you know, kind of what we've seen. But I'm I'm curious to hear from Dustin what makes this course different than other layouts on ball course ball golf courses. Uh, so. It should be very interesting. You know, the the makeup of the trees is probably going to look quite a bit different than we saw down in Stockton in the Central Valley. You know, you come up to the Pacific Northwest, we're probably going to have big pines. And, um, you know, I, I think it, it's got a high chance of being very attractive. You know, Glendevere is a, like a, pretty significant sports property. They have two 18-hole golf courses. Uh, There's a brewing company on the property, and they've held other big events, um, Nike Cross Nationals. And this is part of a trend towards moving from, you know, sort of the ideal disc golf courses to the ideal disc golf event spaces, if you want to call them that. I, I think the Pro Tour is going to continue to try to push towards having the ability to have facilities on site that make spectating more attractive. This is business. And so we'll see how this all looks and plays. Um, but yeah, I mean, ultra long, ultra long. Uh, the, uh, the, the FPO track is also quite long. It comes in at 10,500 feet. Um, you know... Quite a contrast to you know U.S. Women's 
a couple weeks ago, uh, just such different styles of golf we're seeing on this stretch of the tour. Uh, notably, today, actually, was we record this on June 2nd, Wednesday, Albert Tom from Estonia, Bazooka, is currently in Mexico. He is about to cross the border. He's been outside of the European Schengen area for two weeks, which enables him to now cross into the United States legally, and he plans to compete at the Portland Open. So this will be the first time we've seen a European player competing at a U.S.-based tournament and at a Pro Tour event since, uh, I guess, Waco of 2020, right before the shutdown. So that's exciting. Uh you know, Albert has been trying to figure out how to get over for, for quite a while. Um, and so I guess I just have to say good luck to him today as he, uh, you know, because I'm sure you can't feel entirely confident you're going to get into the United States until you pass through customs. Yeah, it's going to be exciting to see him back, uh, assuming everything goes well. Also uh, noteworthy, uh, Christian Tatar is currently double registered all the way out through the month of July. Um, so she's registered for worlds. She's registered. Uh, I don't remember the other event she had after that. Um, so, but she's, she's registered all the way out through July for both us as well as European tournaments with the hope it looks like, as we talked with Kristen a while, a little while ago of coming over to the U S to play for a stretch of the tour. So it looks like she's got worlds clash at the canyons, great lakes open and the preserve, but at the same time, She's also got four European events booked on the exact same weekend. So she's registered for all of them. Uh, she's got the contingency plans of however long she's going to stay. Uh, but if we were able to see Kristen Tatar, I think, at four events, I think it would kind of give us, one, an, an excellent view into European disc golf again. Like, bring that back. That's something we definitely want to see. But something else I think is valuable is kind of a benchmark as to what to expect once the tour reintegrates fully. Uh, and while it may just be a short preview and, and an anomaly based on the fact that Kristen Tatar hasn't been able to play many events relative to the U.S. women's, I think it still would be a valuable insight as to what we may expect when the rest of the Europeans come over. I mean, I, we have to just say it like it is. Like if if she does, she's in Croatia right now with her partner Silver Lot. Uh, Silver's also registered for Worlds. If she makes it over, and the, we hope that, that she can, I mean, she absolutely will be a contender. Like I'm. I guess I can't say with like certainty that I would put her in my top five for worlds, but it's going to be a strong consideration. I mean, she could win. She could win. I think people forget how good she is. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we, we will hopefully have a couple of European faces at, uh, at worlds. And, uh, but for this weekend for Portland, it will just be Albert Tom assuming that he gets through and gets through customs in Portland uh, today. So should be fun to see how that all shakes out. And it'll be fun to have him back on the course. Maybe we'll catch him on some coverage. I wouldn't be surprised if they put him on the uh, feature card. I actually don't know if they've announced the feature cards yet. They probably have. I haven't seen it. I'll check. Okay. I'll check right now. Um, so... As we get ready for this weekend, we are going to talk with Dustin Keegan, who's going to tell us a lot more about this Glendevere track, what we can expect to see this weekend, what kinds of players are going to have an advantage out there. It is ultra long, but it's not just pure wide open. There's lots of tee shots that have gaps to hit. There's gaps in the middle of fairways in some cases. Uh, there's definitely some tricky OB and hazard. So we'll hear now from Dustin Keegan. Stay with us. It's The Upshot. The Upshot is presented by Pound Disc Golf, makers of the best bags in the sport. If you've got a pound bag, you can also get a pound ambassador patch out now. You want to rep your favorite pound carrying pro? Well, they've got patches, $10, 100% of the profit from each one sold goes directly to the ambassador. So whether you want to rep Nate Sexton, Kona Panis, Jeremy Colling, Lisa Fakus, Dustin Keegan, Scott Withers, or Zoe Andike, 
They've got the patches up on pounddiscgolf.com. Go check them out. Joining us now on the Upshot is Dustin Keegan, touring professional as well as the course designer of Glen Devere, the course that's going to be featured this weekend at the Portland Open. Dustin, welcome to the Upshot. Ah, thank you, Charlie. Super glad to be here. It's my first time. Yeah, it's 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 awesome to have a, a brand new face. Um, first of all, the uh, weather behind you in Portland looks just beautiful. Oh, it's stunning. It's bluebird mid. It's actually kind of hot today. It was like low to mid 90s, but it's supposed to cool off throughout the week and literally just be as dreamy as you can imagine for a disc golf here in the Northwest. Fantastic. So uh, tell us a little bit about how this Glendivere course came together. I've seen some stuff a little bit here and there. It came together really fast. Like, what exactly happened here? Okay, so brief, long story short, um, we tried as hard as we possibly could to Blue Lake to keep the tradition alive and uh, represent Portland in a world-class way at Blue Lake, which is an amazing venue. And the Pro Tour had everything lined up for Blue Lake, but due to the pandemic, they aren't staffing their parks, the Metro parks here in Portland. And so they're not doing reservations until July. And our event happened to fall in June. So it just wasn't going to work out logistically wise for us to be there and to rent the course. So spring saying, hey, Blue Lake's not looking promising. I'll keep you updated on anything, but let's try to save the event because Beaver State had just gotten canceled. And we're like, we can't lose the entire Portland swing. It'd be devastating, especially as an Oregonian. Like, Oregon and disc golf go hand in hand. So we need the tour to be here. So with uh, Stumptown Disc Golf Club here in Portland and a man named TJ Goodwin, who used to, he was the tournament director for the Masters Cup for a handful of years before he moved up to Portland. Uh, they, I don't know how they got the name here. Maybe someone who works here as a greenskeeper, I believe, plays disc golf and is part of the disc golf club and is running a little temp tournament here in October. So they just like, hey, this golf course was open to a little tiny event. So they just talked to the manager and after a couple couple back and forth, they, the golf course seemed open. So funny timing. I was in Eugene practicing at my home course, literally four days leaving for my two month tour. I get a call from Jeff spring. He says, blue lakes out. We're screwed. How can we save Portland? I have this lead of this potential golf course that might be interested is there any way you could go up there and check it out? And I was like, when? He's like, tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm, I'm leaving in four days. And he's like, can you make it happen? So I literally hung up, packed my one day bag, drove up here, met TJ. He, sh- he showed us around for like maybe three hours right before uh, it got dark. And then like kind of saw like, Hey, this place is big enough. It's epic enough to possibly do something cool here. And TJ wasn't super stoked on the property as far as like a world-class layout, but we also didn't know the boundary limit yet and, and other stuff. So long story short, two days after that, I came back up here and I spent eight hours the first day and nine hours the second day and design the entire course by myself through golfer through ball golfers the entire time it was actually kind of rainy for a couple days so like i designed this entire course without even really throwing a shot and i had like kind of distance control because there's subtle elevation so i needed to see how far the top level players could be throwing off these hills 
just to design some sort of distance. But I did most of the designing based off of like kind of distance numbering and then shot shaping and like finding cool greens and finding the flow. But I literally designed this whole course in about 24 total hours in a span of about three days. So <laughs> it was crazy. But that is wild. The feedback has been amazing so far. Day one of practice started today. So I've been out here since sunrise and it's, it's looking good and people are excited. So when Jeff Spring asked you to design that course, did he say we need the course design ASAP or was he just like, did he ask for just a rough outline? What, what was, I guess the rush if we had the rest of the West coast swing before Portland, I mean, is there a standard about when the caddy book needed to be out or? Yes. Yeah. So everything kind of was on fast track. It really needed to get out within a couple weeks of, you know, me seeing the property. Jeff wasn't going to be able to be here. Um, and nobody on the pro tour is a world-class designer. So it's like they needed the inside of a pro and a designer to, kind of lay the groundwork and find the flow, build the holes and then the pro tour and they can come in and tweak it here and there, which they did. But like uh, for Jeff to have the faith in me, I got enough friends out on tour who put in a good word, like, yeah, trust Dustin. He knows what he's doing. Like it's not about like an ego and a name on a course. Like I'm just trying to build the best course I can build so I can have fun playing it while I play the tournament. And it can challenge the best players in the world at the same time. And one follow-up real quick. Sorry, Charlie. I didn't mean to cut you off there. Um, it, it, have you designed other courses as well? Uh, what's your experience and background with that that kind of set you up for this design? So I, I'm like contracted by Disc Golf Park. I have two Disc Golf Park courses in the ground already and three others that are in the stages of being built. So I've designed about five 18 hole permanent courses around Pennsylvania, Oregon. Those are the only two States. I got four in Pennsylvania and two in Oregon. And then one of them is on a school property. So I've done school designing of shorter fun kids courses with our nonprofit profit you play disc golf and you know over the last six to eight years i've ran a bunch of tournaments just one day pop-up tournaments where i just show up at courses and design a layout and just for fun like let's play here i can rent it for a day and just run a two-day b tier or a two-round one-day b tier and so like i just got enough like clout with jeff plus being Kind of, me and Zoe were, and Jeff were the Kickstarters of Portland Open anyway. We were co-TDs for the last Portland Open. So for him to have the faith and the trust in me that, like, it's not just about the course, it's about representing Portland Open to our brand that we're trying to build as a world-class event that people are looking forward to each year on tour. So, yeah, it was like, I, I have the experience of design and I understand stand design i grew up golfing and playing all sorts of sports I, I love being on golf courses and then i played enough disc golf over the last 10 years that i courses in the u.s and i understand what it takes to challenge the pros like people don't realize how good these players are these days like you can't <laughs> build a generic course and think they're not going to shoot perfect rounds like you have to challenge them in every possible way. And I, I feel proud with how the layouts turned out so far. And I'm excited to see how it shakes out. Now that you've had a chance to play it, how do you grade the course? Good question. That's a great question. I just finished my first actual practice round where I got to play every hole in succession. Um, Jeff Spring made a couple changes over the last few days uh, prior to me getting here to, to solidify them before the tee pads were installed. So two of the holes chain use my tee locations, but change or use my pin locations, excuse me, but then change the tee locations. So they're 
they're kind of the same, but a little different version of them. And so it was my first time really seeing everything. He definitely lengthened it, which is kind of hard to believe. I I had it listed at seven or 11,700 and something feet. And he pushed it to 12.6 right now and some change. So it like he added almost a full thousand feet onto the course, but the, the changes are awesome. I really enjoyed the playing. Like it's hard. There's multiple holes that are going to be really challenging to even get a birdie on. And, you know, that's kind of refreshing coming from disc, disc golf tournaments. Like everybody shoots, you know, 12, 15 downs these days. And it's like, that's what the standards and that's kind of where our tours taking us. So I, I guarantee is going to be over a thousand rated. Like, there's Guaranteed. no doubt. Well, I will just tell you, I will just tell you, we did, we did this whole dance with OTB and we were like, <laughs> Oh, no one's going to shoot double digits. And then they all dip, went and shot double digits. So yeah, I, 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 I will see if you're right. Like Eagles are almost impossible, which is kind of, you know, that's cool. I have three par fives and none of them will be eagled unless you throw it in from a long way away. Yeah, I mean, it's a long, long course. Yeah, it's long, but it's like there, there's enough elevation where it doesn't feel the length of a – it was so flat and you're just ripping driver, 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 driver. I got mid-range approaches. I got technical greens, you know, so you have to attack with slower speed discs. There's layup potential. I don't have the water of OTB, so, like, the risk hazard of losing your plastic isn't there but there's enough OB that it, you can still, you know, get big numbers if you mess up. Uh, what would you say is, I guess, the signature hole? We asked, we asked uh, this question earlier on the subscriber bonus, but what would you say is the signature hole of, of your course here um, that you're excited to see play out this weekend? Well... To me, there's two, and I ha- I can't really decide between them both. They're, they're both par fives. Um, hole seven was my initial signature hole in my layout. Uh, hole nine, Jeff Spring tweaked just a little bit and found this new gap that I didn't realize that we could use. Uh, I didn't know it was on this piece, of our boundary line for our course. So he, he bought hole nine now, and he lengthened the the basket so it's hole nine is playing at 1363 feet and the middle of the hole is uphill so like i don't like it's hard to even get a four putt so like to me like that just equals a signature hole if there's we're playing a par five where five is a good score like that is rare to me so like that's a memorable hole in disc golf but to me, let me describe my signature hole when I designed it. It's hole seven. It's at 1263. It's pretty flat. The first, the first tee shot is a full send, and but you kind of want to be placement a little bit. You can't just throw it right. So you want to place it, but it go as far as possible. The second shot, you can go this kind of cut off hyzer route, or you can go this nice slow turnover and hyzer if you're a righty back in and uh, land on this golf tee. So uh, that would be another like 400 feet shot. So if you go 500 off the tee, 400 to the landing zone, then you have 390 feet to clear water to a postage stamp green that's surrounded by OB long car path, uh, bunker short, short left, and then a green right in front of it. So it's this tiny little green that you have to attack with a fast speed disc. And be- before any of the changes, I felt like that was my signature hole. And it was the only only little water pond on the entire course. And you have to clear it on your third shot to get up and down for your birdie. So I'm really excited to see how people play that hole. That hole would just destroy me. I would be done. I would walk off the course. That would be it. Um, that, so there's been some pros t- 
talking generally, but even like today, Paul Macbeth posted on Instagram, uh, you know, kind of complaining about another ball golf course on tour. And uh, we, we, this has kind of come up a little bit because we've had a lot uh, this season, just in general, lots of big wide open courses. And, and this is another one of those. Uh, you know, do you think that's a fair criticism that there's like maybe too many ball golf courses on tour right now? And, uh, you know, does this, do you think Glendevere doesn't necessarily fit the mold of being a ball golf course in the way that we tend to think about it? Well, I'm kind of indifferent about it. I like, I like being on golf courses personally. Um, I started my sports career as a golfer so it's like kind of at home out here and where i learned disc golf later and the reason we're here is not about us the players it's about the viewership it's about being able to host spectators it's about being able to show the world what we're doing and it's really hard as much like i'm from oregon i'm from the heart of the woods i'm a woods golfer it's just hard to show how hard woods golf is on camera. And I understand Paul's set of sure golf course really long and you have to because they're more open. But until we have proper properties, hopefully in the future, you know, people like me, designers can build extremely wooded disc golf courses that can host thousands of spectators that aren't sitting on top of every other hole. Something cool about Glendevere is you don't really see very many other holes while you're playing your hole. It's kind of each hole is its own little course almost, you know, you're, you're there's enough space out here. You're secluded. And I, I love that aspect. I know Milo MacGyver is kind of like that. And mm-hmm. Milo is a disc golf course, but you know, it, was being carved out to be a golf course before the flood happened and then the ruined the land and then they donated to the state park and years later disc golf was put there but like they were starting to carve it for a golf course that's why it's so spectacular so it's just yeah i don't know i i agree with paul like i it's as a disc golfer, I want to see myself hit gaps and have late turn and angle control, you know, speed control like a day law, but it's, you know, day law had no service. So we couldn't have live broadcast day laws hard. It's hard to represent how hard a wooded shot is at like 215 feet with elevation because like, it's hard to see elevation on a through a camera. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I think it's a good place for disc golf right now on golf courses based on where we're trying to go as a sport and how we're trying to like showcase our sport to people who don't know what disc golf is. Well, you got to go out there and and win on Glendevere this weekend so that everybody can accuse you of, you know, cooking the books to to your own (laughs) style. Wouldn't that just be great? That would be amazing. (laughs) All right. Well, Dustin, thanks so much for taking some time for us and uh, good luck out there this weekend. Of course. Thank you guys. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Ulti World. All you guys do. Really appreciate you guys and everything for the sport. Keep oh, watching. One... This... Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. W- one last thing for you. How good can Ella Hansen be? Oh, next level. People don't even <laughs> know. this. She's She's like a superstar. Like, we don't even know, you know, like these ultimate people come up to us and they're like, oh, you know, Ella? Oh, my God, you know, Ella, you know, Ella? and we're like, yeah, like we were just teaching her like she didn't know how to putt. We're teaching her how to putt. What do you mean? And, and people are like, like, she's like LeBron in the ultimate world, man. Like she's the next she's the real deal. Two time world champion, led the Oregon Ducks to a national title as a freshman. Like she's legit and she's only been playing. 14 months and she's already you know getting thousand rated around all right dustin thanks very much dustin keegan with us here on the upshot we'll be right back welcome back to deep look 
So this weekend's course is a 24-hour wham bam crazy whirlwind course. I I'm let's <laughs> see how it plays out. I I know I was talking to you Labari. What what happened here? Um <laughs> I'm skeptical. Uh and it's it's no knock on Dustin in any in any way shape or form. Um but you know, there was a lot of hype around OTB. Uh you know, the the legendary course designer, the distance, the shots, and you know, we even you even highlighted like the the diversity of Eagles shots. But it at the end of the day it still felt like a golf course and uh, you know, I think I think here, you know, Dustin doesn't dispute that, but rather he flips it and says, "We should just start playing on golf courses." And so I think that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different assertion than we usually have. I think a little bit that, uh, you know, that he just comes out and says, "Yeah, it's not just something we're tolerating. I think it's good for the sport." So that there's a trade off. You want to have tight wood lines with classic disc golf style that Paul McBeth, you know, Paul McBeth's from Southern California. These are the courses that he knows. He goes to daylight, he feels at home. And if you want to have that, and it, I mean, I think I personally would say like those courses are more fun to play in my view as an amateur player, but you do have the trade-off of not being able to present it as well on television. And I don't know how we find, like we're, we're in a weird spot. You know what? We're in a weird spot. We're in between where we once were, which was just purely choosing courses based on how fun they were to now we're entering this world where we're choosing courses and, and locations and venues based on how good it is for spectators and cameras. Um, and the problem is you don't want to, you don't want to go too far in that direction. In my opinion, you don't want to go to the point where it's just like, well, we're just going to play all ball golf courses. Cause that's, cause that's the, you know, that's, that's the optimal for fandom because it's not optimal for fandom. Ultimately, like there's already people pushing back on social media and saying another ball golf course. Why? And you've got pros doing it. And so, I don't know what the solution is. I think that these kinds of courses belong on tour, but it does. I mean, when you go through the list of all the courses that we've played this year on the elite series, there are a lot of very big open shots and we just haven't played a whole lot of more technical courses yet. And uh, I think the balance may be a little bit off right now. I, I agree. And I think the hard thing is I, I'd never... I mean, I understand that the the having spectators present is obviously easier to facilitate on a, on a ball golf course. You know, we've talked about that, considered that live coverage far easier. When Dustin says it's harder to appreciate for a new play, like a new new to the sport person, spectator viewer, um, it's harder for them to appreciate a fantastic woods golf shot versus a ball golf shot. Um, I think he might be right about that. I have a friend who is very much sports oriented. She wa I mean, she knows more about sports than anybody I've ever met. And I showed her disc golf and I, I think I showed her probably the pro tour championships. I think is what it was. And she wasn't terribly impressed. And to me, I was just like mind blown. I'm like, I, I don't know how you're not impressed by these shots. Um, <laughs> but there's a reason that Philo's shot around the world or seen around the world or, you know, that, that albatross is the first thing that non-disc golfers bring to the community. They're like, have you seen that one shot? That was just, just wild. And I mean, it is in the woods, but it's it's way more open than Dela, right? Like it it is to flex a shot like that. It, and if it, maybe it's a balance of the course, um, but I, I think that there's there's something to be said there. But the hard part is is I think that you begin to lose interest in viewers as they become more invested in the sport. So you maybe get them there with ball golf courses, but you sure don't keep them. I don't think you keep spectators. I don't think you keep numbers at the disc golf network up. If every one of your courses are ball golf courses, 
Because you have to throw 700 feet, and then you got to walk up to your 700 foot shot. I don't. I don't know. It, it's it's an interesting conundrum to have to address. Here's what it is. Here is the solution. Okay. The solution is you carve your own courses out of private property, and you build your own venues. That's honestly yeah. it. We need more Maple mm -hmm. Hills. It's that simple. Like. You want to have big, wide open shots, but you also want to have tucked tight greens. You want to have technical shots. You also want to have bombers. You can get that. But when you have to force the course into the land based on here's a golf course, make a course out of it. Like you're going to like, I'm not a course designer, but I know what I would do. I would go out and say, okay, let's put a tee pad here because you have to hit this gap. And then we need to have the basket, you know, this is going to be a par four. It needs to be at least 750 feet. And let's put the basket here in this nice little protected area. And it honestly doesn't matter what's between A and B because you don't have the choice. You're crossing a fairway. So if you want to have the beauty, you want to have the challenge, you want to have the bomber shot, you want to have the downhill, you want to get all these things. You have to design that literally from the ground up, not from here's some, here's some land, do your best. And credit to the course designers who can do their best. I, I think it's literally amazing that Dustin Keegan built this course in 24 hours. That's insane. Uh, I'm impressed. Like, I don't even need to watch the <laughs> tournament to be impressed by that. But at the end of the day, like, this is where we are right now. This is growing pains. We need, like, the for-profit venue that is disc golf exclusive to become a thing if we're going to have the kinds of courses that we see in our brains as the dream. So maybe we'll get there. I think we will get there eventually. And, you know, these courses belong on tour. Again, I think they belong on tour. But, like, I go back into February and it's like, all right, Las Vegas Challenge. You know, this is not really my favorite kind of tournament because it's pretty wide open. But like, ah, I haven't seen disc golf in a while. Like, I'm excited to watch people play and <laughs> bomb it out there. And like now it's June and we're still watching the same kind of courses. And it's like, wait a minute. I got duped. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's why it was so f refreshing to watch Daylock. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's get to our picks, Josh. Um, I want to just rattle through them really quick this week. Uh, you know, obviously no one's played this course. Everybody's seen it for the first time. It's really, really long. Uh, the fact that it's really, really long heavily influenced my picks. Uh, so I'll go first in FPO in fifth place. Now I'm going to go from first. First place, I got Paige Pierce. Second place, I got Katrina Allen. Come on. Distance, baby. <laughs> Haley King in third. Kona Panis in fourth. And mm, Ella Hansen in fifth. I'm doing it. Uh, don't you mean LeBron James? Quite, <laughs> quite the endorsement from Dustin Keegan. Uh, I, you know what? She's she might not play ultimate anymore, which which would be uh, imagine if LeBron stopped playing basketball. You know, he, he, consi he considered being a tight end. He said he could do it. So this this is could do this it. is the LeBron playing tight end scenario. It's Ella Hansen coming to disc golf. Um, my picks: FPO, Katrina Allen. Lost by lost a page by one stroke at OTB. At, I I want a battle. I want the same thing. I want it one stroke difference regardless of who wins it. Page in second, Jessica Weiss in third, Haley King in fourth, Missy Gannon in fifth. All right, and uh, take it away, MPO. Uh, I have the bird himself, Eagle McMahon. Uh, Come on, yeah, OTB. He it's just it's just getting longer. <laughs> I I see I see a hole that's uh, what over two miles long, and I'm like, all right, I know who I'm picking. Uh, Eagle McMahon, Calvin Heinberg, second, Garrett Gerthy, third, Ricky Wysocki, fourth, Drew Gibson in fifth. The big arms, every one of them. Um, I got a theme with that too. I'm going with Calvin here. Calvin hasn't won an Elite Series event yet this year. I think it's his time. Uh, he's due. He's due. <laughs> I've got Ricky Wysocki in second. I keep picking Ricky high at tournaments, and then he's not finishing that high. Is it time to start worrying? We're going to have to talk about that after this weekend if Ricky doesn't show up in a big way. Um, I got Eagle in third. Drew Gibson in fourth. And I Kevin Jones is starting to find the rhythm i've got kevin jones in fifth place i'm keeping an eye on kevin jones as he picks up a little momentum heading into worlds okay so charlie i know that we had talked new segment 
every week moving forward, we're going to be doing an over and under. Uh, gonna gonna take a little bet. Everyone at home, you can listening in, make some bets with your friends. Uh, I'm not going to rub in the fact that you were completely wrong on our over underscore OTB, but I'm going to, I'm going to give you a chance. What was eight and a half at OTB? Best score. Yeah. 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 yeah I said, I said, yeah I, the line was too low, but even still, I wasn't even close. Um, okay. You, you want to, you want to run it back? Yep. Yep. I'm giving you redemption. So this week we're going to do hot score again, over under, we're going to take Dustin Keegan, the course designer's word. He says he thinks double digits is going to be hard. So, Charlie, double digits, 10. Are you taking over or under? 10 and a half. We'll say 10 again. Th- or 9 and a half, sorry. 9 and a half. 9 and a half. I won't be fooled again. I'm taking the over. You're taking the over. Okay. I'll take the under. Um, we'll have to have Dustin, e- T- Dustin back on if, uh, if Eagle decides to shoot 15 or 16. I mean, because here's the thing. The Ams played the OTB course. And even par was like 1,010 rated or something. Yep. And then the pros came and were like, oh, no, we can just throw rollers and like squash the entire concept. It's like, okay, wait a minute. The pros figure out how to score. So I, 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 will, I will not bet against 10 under. I will not okay. bet against it. All right. So there it is. There it is. Everyone else, make your picks. Make, uh, let's hear the over-under. Thanks for joining us today, everybody. We, show two, same week. We're back. We'll be back with you uh, Tuesday morning for a Portland Open recap show as we head into this kind of final stretch before Worlds. We got a Silver Series event. We got the Utah Open. Um, make sure you check out our subscriber bonus segment. We talk with Worlds TD Jade Sewell about the courses at Worlds as well about the Utah Open. Spectators, a lot of spectators coming. Uh, and and a whole lot more. So I hope you join us there. You can become a subscriber for less than $4 a month at discgolf.ultiworld.com slash subscribe. All right, everybody. For Josh Mansfield, I'm Charlie Eisenhood saying so long. We'll talk to you next week right here on The Upshot. The Upshot.